All right. Uh, hello, everyone entering the Zoom room. Uh, my name is Morgan, and I'm an event manager at Politics and Pros. And I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Soon, I will drop a link in the chat for where you can order a copy of Speaking of Race, Why Everyone Needs to Talk About Race and How to Do It, straight from PNP's website. We also have book plates signed by the author as well. You can ask our speakers a question tonight by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can towards the end of the program, but we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce tonight's guests. Celeste Headley is an award-winning journalist, author, and professional speaker who has appeared on NPR, PBS World, PRI, CNN, BBC, and other international networks. She was formerly a host at National Public Radio, anchoring shows including Tell Me More, Talk of the Nation, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. For many years, Celeste has been a mentor and managing editor for NPR's Next Generation Radio Project, training young reporters and editors in broadcasting. I believe we'll be in conversation with Jen White, an award-winning journalist and host of WAMU and NPR's daily talk show, 1A. She is also host of the critically acclaimed podcast, Making Oprah, Making Obama, and 16 Shots, The Police Shooting of Laquan McDonald. Let's give our guests a virtual round of applause. Well, hello, Celeste. It's good to see your face. It is good to see your face too. <laughs> well, I was really, I mean, we've, we've talked so many times, but this is the first time we're having a face, well, a virtual at least face-to-face -face conversation. So I'm, I'm happy about that at least. I, I wanna start with the why of this book. Why write this book and why write it now? You know, um, Interestingly enough, last year when uh, George Floyd was murdered um, and the protests broke out, my editor at HarperCollins uh, sent me a message that said, you know, you should consider writing a book on this. You know, we could really use your voice. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not mm. doing that. Um, you know, I didn't. There's so many reasons why I, I would hesitate to write a book about race. I mean, number one, it's it's exhausting. Um, it's uh, something you know, I end up talking about all the time anyway. There's a lot of great books out there on the subject. Um, and then, you know, there, there's the thing that when you write a book about race, it's possible that will be the only thing you talk about for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of different reasons for that. But as I've started to see Con people, you know, I, what I began to see was um, especially some earnest, very, very sincere white people trying to have the conversation and oftentimes mucking it up. Um, I saw people of color exhausted and angry. And so that conversation was difficult too. And I thought to myself, you know what, this is something I can actually help with. Like this portion, A, there's not really any books out there that will walk you step by step through it. But this part, this I can do. So I wrote it. What did you think you had beyond the expertise, right, around how to shape a good conversation from your personal experience, your lived experience? What did, the, what did you think you could add to this conversation about how to have conversations about race and racism that's unique to you? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I am what people sometimes call racially nondescript. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think I'm Dominican and I have been asked that question. What are you so many times in my life? I can't even count it. Mm -hmm. Just a note. Please don't ask people that question. <laughs> right. um, so what ends up happening is people say things to me and around me that they would not say if they knew I were black. Mm -hmm. um, or if they knew I were Jewish, by the way, but more often it, it's if they knew I were black. I hear those things um, that somebody with darker skin probably would not be there for. And in a way, I mean, I used to hate it, but now I sort of see it as an opportunity um, that I'm there when people are telling the truth. Um, and, and maybe that allows me to have a conversation that is not possible from my darker skinned brothers and sisters, right? Like 
perhaps this opens up some doors for me. Maybe my lighter skin, whether it's research or not, makes people feel more comfortable talking to me about these things. Whatever it is, I have been in these situations where I have been able to address some of these issues in a way that I think others may not have. I mean, and the other thing is, of course, that, you know, I've had to think about who I am and, and what I am for a really long time. You know, I didn't get an engraved invitation to any of the clubs. Um, I, uh, you know, the thing is, is among uh, Black people, I had no desire to pass. Um, I would consider that to be an absolute betrayal of my family and my ancestors. Um, but of course, there's a hesitation if you're very light skinned to, to identify as Black, you don't want to you don't want to pretend like you have uh, paid the same price for the color of your skin that others have. So, you know, it's just this really fraught situation. And I, I have to assume that that's true, not just for me, but for all kinds of people, because there is no one skin color for black people. There is no one skin color for white people or Latinx people or whatever. I have to assume that these conversations are so individual that it, it can be difficult. And, you know, I was right about them. Do, do you remember when you started to lean into those conversations? Because as you said, people would say things around you that they wouldn't necessarily say around someone who was darker complected, and that they wouldn't necessarily say if I was in the room. And that's not comfortable for you, but it would also be very easy for you to just, you know, slide right on out the door <laughs> without any comment or any sort of interaction when did you make that 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 decision to lean into it? I think it was when I was 17, no, 18 and started college. You know, up until then, I think I was so um, afraid of confrontation um, that I didn't speak up. And, you know, a lot of the people saying these things were to me were adults and um, I didn't feel comfortable but when I got to college, I started, I was a, you know, I was a waitress like many college students are. And I worked at a dinner theater in Flagstaff, Arizona, which gets a large international clientele. It, Flagstaff is a huge tourist town. And um, people would say things to me that were just, I, I could not stay silent anymore. I just saw it as such an insult, not just to me, but my whole family, like the things that they sacrificed for uh, to succeed. It was just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So um, I started, I, I just made a promise to myself. This is when I was about 18, that every single time somebody said something like that, I would speak up and be, remain as calm um, and uh, non-threatening as possible, but I would just, I call it what it was, which was racist. Um, and I have stuck to that ever since, uh, which has not always made me popular, but it's made me able to live with myself. In what you said, two things stood out to me. You said you would engage in the conversation in as calm and as non-threatening of a way as possible. And I think that that's part of what I hear people struggle with is if I'm confronting racism or racist behavior, why, why do I need to be calm? Why do I need to be non-threatening? I feel threatened, you know? And so, and you explore a lot of the sort of emotional work around this in the book, but just from a starting point, how do you suggest people engage in, in these types of conversations when it comes to just the, the really basic emotions that, that tend to accompany these, con these conversations? So the first thing is, is that if you're angry, that's not a good time to have that conversation. I would, I would walk away. The other a big caveat here is that if someone is saying something, something to, that has, or has said something or done something that denies you your own humanity, do not have that conversation. It's not worth it. You don't need to put yourself in that position. You know, I, I include an, in, an interview with a former neo-Nazi in the book, but I make very clear that I do not want anyone seeking out conversations with neo-Nazis. It's not safe. Um, but 
in order to get yourself into that emotional state, you have to ask yourself why you want to talk about this. Um, because one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they go into these conversations intending to prove someone wrong or dunk on them or change their mind. Um, and I, I it would be awesome if that were possible, but it's just it's not. The statistical uh, chances of that happening are so close to zero that it's just a non-entity. So you're not going to change somebody's mind or educate them over the course of your conversation. So what can you do? What's the purpose of that conversation then? Um, the purpose of the conversation should be to, to make some kind of connection. If you can't uh, educate them, you can learn from them. And that is valuable. I mean, one of the things that has made me more, much more skillful at these conversations is because I've had so many of the, about them that I have learned from all the people I've, I've spoken to about where they're coming from, why they believe these things, the connections that they make in their brain and where maybe those connections go wrong. A really interesting thing that Derek Black said, Derek Black is the former neo-Nazi whose godfather is actually uh, David Duke. Um, he said that if you're going to go into a conversation with someone who is racist, you have to know their beliefs so well that you can repeat them back to them because they won't respect you if you don't actually understand where they're coming from. Um, and this is actually something I 100% agree with and learned early on. So in terms of doing that emotional work, just shifting your goal, just shifting it from something you can't do. I want to change their mind. I want to dunk on them to I want to either learn from them or make some kind of human connection with them, which you absolutely can accomplish, that A, lowers the stakes mm -hmm. because this is almost always possible, um, but it also puts you in a completely different frame of mind. Um, you're not gonna get so frustrated because you're not beating your head against the wall. I can also hear in response to that though, people saying, why, what is the, what is the benefit of making a human connection with someone who has racist ideas? Um, what is the benefit to understanding where they're coming from? I don't want to understand where they're coming from because I think it's, it's terrible. And I think that's where a lot of the resistance comes in. It's like, I don't want to make a human connection with someone who I don't want in my life at all, full stop. So how do you navigate that space? A few things. First of all, having the conversation with them doesn't put them in your life. Um, that's number one. Uh, Unless they're, they're, as long as they're not like a family member or so. Right, but they're then different. they're still in your life even if you don't have the conversation with them, right? Like the conversation is not gonna change whether they're in your life or not in your life. Um, but this is, this is what I will say is that the, when people imagine these conversations, they, and I tell them, have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you. Almost the first thing they go to is they're imagining that blatant overt racist. It is highly unlikely that's the conversation you're gonna have. Really unlikely. There just not, aren't a huge number of overt racists that those of us who think differently have contact with. Um, you will, however, encounter a gigantic number of people who suffer from unconscious bias. That's all of us. That's every single human being on the planet. In fact, the, the greatest experts who have researched unconscious bias more carefully and for longer than anyone else said that even studying unconscious bias made them no better at fighting it in their own personal life. So there's number one, which means that it, if someone doesn't even realize that they have these assumptions bubbling under the surface somewhere, if this is the society they were grown up in, right? And we all were. We all watched Brady Bunch and picked up sexism that's lingering somewhere underneath um, our, our conscious mind. We all picked up assumptions about people, assumptions about uh, differently abled people, assumptions about people with accents from the whole world around us. So if that's the person that you're confronting, A, you can be quite helpful by just giving them a different perspective 
And B, actually understanding them better is also a way that you understand yourself better. It also helps you understand everybody in your life better. Um, there is so often a time where someone will have a good friend or a coworker and they'll say something that surprises you where you're like, I did not expect that inappropriate thing to come out of your mouth. I, I think that by having these conversations and getting to know one another, creating a culture of correction in which it's okay to make mistakes because we're all a work in progress is going to actually move the needle. This, this tactic of avoiding the conversation, which is what we have done for generations, we keep thinking, we keep thinking that racism will age out, hmm. that somehow the younger generation is going to grow up and this generation is going to be open-minded and inclusive. And, and once the millennials get to their maturity, racism will be over. No, wait, sorry, Gen Z. Once Gen Z gets to there, it's not going to happen. All of us in, inherit the gener not only the, the bias, bias that's fed to us by our, our media, our teachers, our, our family, but we also inherit very, very quickly at a young age, as young as three, all of the unconscious bias that is living in our siblings and our parents and our grandparents and our neighbors. So we cannot ignore it. We have to face it. And in that particular case, let's learn how to have these conversations in a way that is non-threatening to both people, both to them and to you, in a way that can actually help you grow even the tiniest bit. And you don't have to like them. You recount in, in the book several instances where you've had conversations with people um, in passing, you know, maybe at an airport. Is there a difference in the way you have these conversations about racism with that person who, you know, you have the conversation with them and then they move out of your life and someone who is very much a part of your life, maybe a family member or um, a coworker, uh, someone you care about and, and already feel connected to and you want to keep them around but there's that that tension there um i if there i used to have a difference between those two um because i i thought that if i wanted to make a connection with that person at the airport um that i needed to hurry there was all this sort of baggage on me whereas the person in my life i could go really slowly and be patient and just kind of bring it up every time they said the inappropriate thing so I used to think there was a difference. Now I, I'm not putting a burden on myself of accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I basically approach them all the same way. I will say that I have done a great deal of study in, uh, in interrupting microaggressions. Um, so microaggressions are the most common force uh, a, a type of racism that people of color encounter. Um, even though they're called a micro, studies show that they are as damaging both to your well being and to your chances for opportunities, promotion, et cetera, as overt racism. So there's nothing micro about the impact they have. And so um, when I have that kind of conversation, that in itself is its own little formula. Um, like I will never, I will try to never let the microaggression reach a period. I try to interrupt it in the middle as, as soon as I hear it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes a certain amount of discipline. So in terms of types of conversations, they're all pretty much the same thing. I mean, I'm using the Socratic method. I'm asking them questions so that they can uh, reason through these things themselves. So I'm forcing them to articulate themselves. Um, I'm trying to establish, establish some kind of common bond. Um, I, I'm making use, making sure that I keep it personal, that I don't talk about racism writ large, but my own experience with it. And, and that can happen whether it's somebody, you know, in the hotel or somebody that you work with every day. Mm -hmm. The way you sourced this book was really interesting because you talked to a, a wide range of people, everyone to that former neo-Nazi, um, to um, a, a neurologist. Talk about the approach you took in, in writing this book and trying to really craft, I guess, just a how-to manual <laughs> for, for how to have these conversations. I mean, I think that... Um... I've read a lot of books on race and racism and a lot of memoirs 
by people of color. And the, the one thing that has become extremely clear to me is that race is extremely individual to a person, <laughs> to, to that individual person. And, and that's probably because race isn't real, right? It's not a thing. <laughs> Biologically, scientifically, there's no such thing as race. Race is only real because racism is real. Um, and what that means, because this is not part of your physiology or your DNA, is that everyone's experience with racial identity is unique to themselves. And, and so when I went to write this book, I, I just thought, I'm going to have to gather as many different perspectives as I possibly can, um, because there's so much about race I don't know because it's not me. And so th the other thing is that when I went to do these interviews, um, I... I wanted to keep them in the interview format where you could see both their, my questions and their response because the book's about conversation, right? So I wanted people to see that excerpt of an actual conversation, which was barely edited. I mean, edited to clean it up and fix the grammar and that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, I wanted to get a wide variety, not just, you know, I, there's, I spoke to lots of Black people, of course, but from all kinds of different generations, Tori Williams Douglas, who's quite young, to Beverly Daniel Tatum, who's an elder statesman in the community. So I wanted a broad range of both experiences and perspectives and ideas about how to come at this thing. Was there one of those interviews that you still think about a lot? I mean, I, I know you talked to so many people for the book, but is there one you find yourself returning to? I mean, there's several of them. Um, I think a lot about uh, Mitch Landrieu's uh, the interview I did with him. Uh, he was the former Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana and more notably the mayor of, of New Orleans when he uh, pushed to bring down the last of the Confederate statues there. And I think, I think what sticks with me with Mitch Landers is how intentional he was in talking to his own people, right? He didn't speak, when you read back through the speech that became quite famous, um, he did not speak for anybody else. He spoke from a white male's perspective and his audience was white people and he spoke directly to them. And that was so effective. And you know, I could give you all the statistics and the science behind it that the, the number one most persuasive person in this space, in the DEI space is actually a white, guy. Um, they are much more likely to be persuasive. They're much more likely to be respected when they speak about these issues than pretty much every other demographic. So there's that. But also there's just this idea that he was in and of that community and he was speaking to his own community. And it made me think, you know, we probably underestimate how powerful we are in, in the influence that we have on the people right around us. Um, that one, yeah. I think that one sticks with me a lot. Farai Chidea's interview sticks with me because, I mean, Farai, she just tells it like it is. She's such a truth teller um, that I found myself when she would say things go thinking, yep, yeah, yes, yes, yes. You referenced something um, a moment ago. Well, it was a little earlier in the conversation when you talked about, you know, when people engage in these conversations you know, we make mistakes, you know, we say the wrong thing, we make the wrong turn. And I think that can also be a, a potential barrier to engaging in these conversations. We're just afraid. We don't, we don't want to misstep. How do you overcome that fear or course correct if you do find that you've kind of mucked it up? I think that the best way to do this is, is expect that you're going to screw up. And this is true of people of color as well. Frankly, um, uh, people of color make mistakes with me all the time. You know, I was, I was moderating a panel at the Harlem Museum on James Baldwin, and we had three very distinguished, uh, smart professors who are experts in the field. And at one point, um, one of them was saying, oh, and you know, Obama, uh, you know, a black man, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, he is half white. And he made a, a snarky comment to the audience, like, should I inform her what this is all about? And I was like, you don't need to inform me of anything. I'm mixed race. Mm. So I just wanted to point out that Barack Obama was mixed race as well. I think it matters. And he came up to me after and he was like, you dogged me. And I was like, brother, you dogged yourself. Like, 
Mm. You, you know, nothing gives you protection from screwing up, from accidentally making assumptions that you shouldn't make. Um, and this is true of everyone. I mean, the people I think that are most afraid of making mistakes are often white people because for some reason they've gotten into their minds the idea that being called racist is the absolute worst thing that you could be called. So I think the best thing to do is just assume you will screw up. You are going to do it. So then it becomes an issue of when I screw up, how then do I handle it? And so that's, I mean, a whole chapter I devoted to just walking through what to do when you say the wrong thing, not if. You're on the other side of this, of writing the book now. Um, it went on sale today. Anytime we were chatting before, uh, we started here, anytime you, you engage in this space publicly, there are gonna be reactions. People are going to have a response to what you write, what you share. How present was that in your mind as you were researching and writing the book that I'm really stepping into the fray here? Um, it was extremely present in my mind uh, before I made the decision to write the book and as I was writing the proposal. Um, I just was like, am I ready for this? <laughs> um, you know, you look at people like Isabel Wilkerson or Ingram Kennedy and I mean, man, I, I can't even imagine how they have the fortitude to keep coming back to this subject again and again and again. It takes incredible determination and strength. Um, once I began writing it, I stopped worrying about the critics. I was more worried about making sure that the book was as um, resonant as possible, which means I had to be so careful with my language. I had to have a ton of people read it to make sure that I, I wasn't accidentally screwing up, just to go back to the idea that people will screw up. Um, but I got to tell you, Jen, this book wrecked me. I mean, mm. I writing this book, I was wrecked for at in least two. In I way? just, when I finished and I turned it in, I couldn't, I was not functional. I was exhausted and sad. And I just, I just, there were some days I just did not want, want to get out of bed. I was just exhausted. Um, and I've never had that experience before. I mean, you know, we, we're journalists. We report on very tough things all the time. Sometimes you're doing live coverage while people are still dying and suffering in a, in a tragedy. And so I, I don't think I was ready for the reaction that I had, um, but it, it wrecked me. And I think, you know, there are some stories that I tell in the book that I've never told anybody ever before in my life, literally no one. Um, but my goal was to be as honest as possible. And I have to wonder, I'm not entirely sure why I, I was just overwhelmed um, after I finished it, um, mm -hmm. except to say that this subject is fraught. Um, it, it, it matters to me. Um, you know, racism has hurt my family even with as light a skin as I am, it has hurt me again and again and again. And it's tough to talk about. Mm. It's tough. The fact that you were feeling sad, um, it's, it's surprising because in reading the book, it's very, I would say optimistic, optimistic in tone. It is, it is realistic, but also, optimistic, but it sounds like the emotional experience of writing it, maybe that's not what you actually felt? No, I think I do. I do feel optimistic, right? Like I wouldn't, the whole purpose of the book was that I think there is an opportunity. And I think we have a unique opportunity right now um, because we are finally at a place where the majority of Americans recognize how urgent the problem is and recognize that their friends and co-workers and colleagues and neighbors are suffering because of racism. That's, as far as I know, never really happened before. May, maybe during the civil rights era, but in any case, we do have a unique opportunity and I, and I do think we can change it. 
If that's what we want, we can change it. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I had never had to tell these own personal stories before. I'd never had to dig down deep and think about what it takes me to, to have these conversations all the time. And, and the times that I felt rejected even by my own people, the people I think of my people, the people I grew up with. Uh, um, and and uh, I, I don't think it made me sad because I'm not optimistic. I think it made me sad because I was dredging up memories that I had locked away for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, this is one of the things, one of the things I talk about in the book is how you need to get consent um, before you have some of these conversations. And this is why, because even though the process of engaging in this kind of conversation is inherently optimistic, inherently, it can dredge up memories of pain. And we have to make sure that we're in the emotional place to be able to do that. And we have to accord that kind of grace to others as well. You know, of late, I've found myself thinking a lot about both the possibilities of conversation, but also the limitations. And I wonder how you're thinking about both sides of that coin, both the possibilities and the limitations. Um, I mean, there are always limitations to conversation, but frankly, we haven't tested those boundaries before. I mean, the way that human beings, homo sapiens have survived on this planet has always been through the most sophisticated collaboration and communication this planet has ever seen. That's how we solve problems. And we know that our species responds in just um, on a, almost on a visceral level to the idea of collaborative problem solving, to this idea of here's this problem and we need to solve it together, right? It's why, uh, it's why, you know, if you have a village, there's not going to be a tiger dragging another person out night after night after night, because eventually everyone's going to get together, whether they like each other or not. And they're going to have a sophisticated conversation about how to collaborate and solve the problem. And, and so in terms of limitations of conversation, there is limitations to everything, but for our species, conversation and communication is the best tool that we have. It's the reason we became dominant on this planet. It wasn't because of our strength. It wasn't because we're particularly strong. Frankly, a few degrees in temperature change and we become uncomfortable. We don't have thick hide. Like the thing that we have is our conversation and our communication. And let me put it another way. You know, you can watch, uh, not to get too sciencey here, but you can watch on the evolutionary tree, the changes that occur in our species between us and say an ape. Um, and at one point, the human being, uh, in order to speak, some evolution, some important evolutionary changes happened. Our, our mouths became longer, our lips became more flexible, our voice box lowered down in our throat. An ape's uh, larynx is right up near the top, which means that in order for us to communicate, there's a chance we can choke to death. When that larynx lowered down, it opened up our airway and made it vulnerable. Apes don't choke. So if you look at it in that sense, we risk life and death to be able to talk to one another. So in terms of the, the capabilities of conversation, that's what we do. Like that's literally our best superpower for our species. And of course there are limitations, but we haven't tested them. We keep trying all kinds of other ways to solve problems instead of the one thing that we have that we do better than anything else. So I would love to test the limitations of conversation. Let's try it. I remember talking to an activist um, back in Chicago and I was interviewing her on the show and I was asking her about and I, and I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but something about shifting people's perspectives, um, the sort of hearts and minds question. And I remember her saying, I'm not really interested in changing hearts and minds. I'm interested in changing policy. 
The hearts and minds can come later, but the policy is what I care about. And that really stayed with me. And you, you've been a journalist for you know, a very long time. You, you know that whole policy tension and how um, racism is, is literally embedded in, in American law at so many levels. Is, I know we're not supposed to go into the conversations with um, an agenda per se, but are you connecting the dots between these, these conversations we have and the sort of longer term change that needs to happen at a system level, as a po at a policy level? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're talking about um, systemic racism and injustice um, that is so deeply embedded that it, it's going to take a revolutionary effort to dig it out. That doesn't mean it's not possible, it absolutely is. Um, but I think of these conversations, whether they happen five minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time or whatever, I think of them as the drip of water that, that eventually will make a hole in a stone. Um, those policies and the systemic issues that we face have to be changed by people. And they have to be changed by people who truly understand the issues, uh, the pain that those, those systems and policies and practices and behaviors cause. Um, and we won't, we, it, it's not gonna be just people of color that do it. it need, we need to decide as a society that we're going to do this together. Um, and so that's, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was a kid, there was a, a, a shampoo commercial <laughs> where they would say, well, I told my friend that, I told two friends that this was shampoo was the best or whatever, and she told two people and she told two people, and then suddenly it's all filled. That's mm -hmm. sort of how I see these conversations, that they, they start out small and incremental, but it will grow. That one person that you have that conversation with, you may spark, if that conversation is, is, is non-hostile, because psychologically speaking, there's a huge difference in the way the brain reacts to a conversation is hostile versus non-hostile. There's that. That's part of the reason I started out by talking about being non-threatening. But if that conversation is non-hostile and you actually give them food for thought, that may be a conversation they then have with someone else, with someone else. They may come away from that conversation because it didn't threaten them, because it didn't make them feel attacked. They may be then more willing to have that conversation again, and maybe again, and maybe again. That's how these changes occur. I have no idea how long that takes. I just know, and I have seen change happen that way. And that's how we can do it. Most of us are not at the level, where most of us are not a CEO, most of us are not Jeff Bezos or uh, Joe Biden or even Kamala Harris or whatever, but this is something that we can do. We're in a time when um, social media is the way a lot of us connect or at least feel like we connect to other people. <laughs> and it's become a space where we try to have these conversations and you're very adamant in your book that that is not the place <laughs> to have these conversations. Why not? Um, because, you know, digitally mediated conversation, which means any conversation uh, that occurs over with, a, with a, a computer chip in between, email, texting, Slack, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Digitally mediated conversations are just not the same to our brains. And we know this. We know this because we have an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. It's pretty much available everywhere now. And we can watch the brain working while that person is still conscious. And so we know what happens in the brain when uh, you have an actual conversation with another person, either in person or on the phone. And we know what happens when you're on email. Um, so one of the most important parts of the brain that has to be engaged at this point, if you take your right finger and you put it at the top of your right ear and you move it up just about an inch and you move it back just about an inch, that's your right temporal parietal junction. And this is to, to make it as simple as possible. That's essentially where your self-control and your empathy and compassion are housed in the outer folds of your brain. So 
that's the part of your brain that you want to have activated when you're when you're having a conversation about race with someone else. It's not, it doesn't come into play when you are reading a tweet. That's one of the reasons why uh, uh, social media tends to polarize us, tends to push us toward the extreme. Writing email tends to escalate conflict, for example. So no, these most, the most complicated, nuanced conversations that you have should not be happening over social media. If you wanna make the appointment to have the conversation and set up a meeting or set up a phone call through Twitter or whatever, great. That's a perfect use for social media, but the conversation itself could, should happen where a human set of ears can hear a human voice. I wanna to turn to some audience questions. And if you do have questions for Celeste, just drop them in the Q&A chat box. Uh, we got this question from Kelly who says, as a white woman, I struggle the most with those who believe that being colorblind is the only appropriate way to go. How do we talk to these individuals when we know they genuinely want to help? Um, so yes, this is super common. Um, one of the things I was talking about recently is that very often, people will come to me and say, you know, Dr. King said that we should all be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin, to which I've started saying, hey, can you recite to me any other line from that speech? Um, and so far, not a single person has been able to do so. And then I ask them, why is it so important to you? Why is it so important, that point, that that's the only line you know from a I don't know, 14,000 word, I forget how many words speech, a long speech. Um, and then it begins a conversation. And it's the same thing that I sort of have with colorblindness. Now, one of the things that I try to do is just sometimes very blandly lay out the facts. I had this conversation recently. Um, we have a community of dog walkers because I live across the street from Rock Creek Park here outside DC. And um, one of the women that was there said, you know, I don't even see color. I treat everyone the same, I don't see color. And I said, well, you know, scientifically, you know, we start noticing color as young as three years old, but I wonder why you say that. What, what is it about color blindness that's valuable to you? And then I get her to start talking to me through, through walking me through her mindset. Sometimes people say that because they think that's the least racist thing you can say. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, it, it's a question of whether it's racist or not racist. It's simply not true. It's incorrect. You know, we have done this test over and over again, and we know that one of the very first things you notice about another person is their perceived race. And it happens in a split second. So it is not true. And so very often I'll just say that, well, you know, it's incorrect. Um, I don't say incorrect, actually. I try not to say people are wrong. I just try to say they're not right. Uh, so I'll say, you know, we know that people notice race pretty instantaneously, but I wonder why you said that. Why did you say that to me? Mm -hmm. um, and then I begin the conversation in a way that may be a little less uh, anxious for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, we got this question from Audrey who says, I'm looking forward to reading your book, Celeste. Have you read Passing or seen the new film based on the book? As I recall, Nella Larson had a white Danish mother and a black American father. Yes, I read the book. I read it quite some time ago. Uh, there was a period of my life um, when I was trying to come to terms with my own identity when I got obsessed with stories about um, mixed, race pe mixed race people. And uh, that was part of my on my reading list when I, I think my senior year of high school and early years of college. I haven't seen the movie yet, so no spoilers, I'm kidding. Um, you know, <laughs> going back to the days of, of Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, the, the slave that he repeatedly raped and had children by, her children passed. They decided to live as, as white people. Sally Hemings was in very rough strokes about the same makeup as I am. In other words, she was one quarter black. Um, and her children chose to pass. Uh, I don't deign to uh, judge anybody for their decisions. These days, I would, I would never in a million years try to pass. I, I find that to be uh, insulting to my own family and ancestors. 
But the idea of pass, we have to ask ourselves why someone would make this choice. In order to pass in those days when that movie is, you, you basically had to walk away from everybody you love and care about and know. And especially in such a segregated society, which frankly we're still in, you, you're not living in the same neighborhoods, you're not shopping at the same stores, but you're walking away from everybody you love. I mean, and for me, a good question for us all to ask ourselves is, what is the benefit there? Why would passing as white be so valuable that somebody would sacrifice that much? And that's a, if you have a reading group, ask that question, because I think it's an important one. Yeah, it's a part of my family's history as well. I remember when I was about oh, probably eight years old, nine years old. And, and we would spend the summers in Mississippi, Yazoo City, where my mom was, was born and going to see my great grandmother and my mother saying, we're going to go visit some cousins and um, going to this house and meeting um, older cousins. And I remember turning to my mom and I said, mommy, who are these white people? <laughs> she just sort of like, you know, shushed me at the moment, but later explained to me that they're not white, but for most of their lives, they had passed. And it wasn't until later in life when they felt safer that they reintegrated with the parts of the family that were recognizably black. Um, and it wasn't as if the family didn't, everyone knew you know, within the family, but there was also a desire to protect them um, because they made that choice for economic reasons, for safety reasons. Um, but I think that's a, probably a part of more people's history than they, than they may even know themselves. Uh, we got this question from Laura who says, Celeste, in doing research and writing this book, what was the most important or unique thing you learned about race that you didn't already know? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think that some of the most enlightening um, research that I did was on defensiveness mm. and why we become defensive and, and um, how to guard against it. I think because, you know, one of the things that I learned was that, uh, you know, we live in a verbal society, you know, so most of the attacks that you suffer in your life are going to be verbal. They're not going to be someone walking up and punching you in the face. We, th we tend to diminish those things, the things that people say that are, are wrong, like I was talking about with microaggressions. But the fact of the matter is, is that for human beings, social standing has always meant the difference between life or death for us. We don't survive on our own. So we need a society around us, meaning that literally, as far as your brain is concerned and your, and your body, your whole biology, social standing is life or death. So those, those insults, those minor comments uh, are much more impactful on your well-being than you may think. Your brain sees them as an attack. And what's very interesting to me um, is that neurologically speaking, your brain, when you hear these kind of statements, your brain literally responds as though you were punched in the face. Mm your respiration will in increase, your heart rate goes up. Essentially, your body is preparing to flee. It sees it as a fight or flight situation. And that to me is a, an eye opener because if you think about this, when we talk about someone becoming defensive, that's not something you can turn off. <laughs> That's why it's so important that you try to have the conversation in a way that guards against defensiveness because once they become defensive, once they are in, physiologically ready to take run for the hills or fight you there's not much chance you're going to be able to have that conversation and that was eye-opening to me in terms of why these conversations are so difficult i want to mention that we do have a few minutes left so if there are any final questions make sure to drop them in the q a before we wrap one of the things i think you you highlight really well in the book is, is the emotional labor part of this and the need to be aware of how much you have to give. Um, 
for people who want to engage in this work, but are just, like you said, so many people of color are just exhausted, exhausted. How do you do that self-check to say, is this, is this healthy for me? Is this the right thing for me to do right now? Am I in the right mental, emotional state to engage in this type of conversation? I would really like people to get into the habit of doing a quick body scan several times a day. And when I say body scan, it only takes a minute at the most. And you're just gonna close your eyes. You're gonna imagine you're in a standing MRI and it begins to scan down through your body and you're not judging anything as good or bad. You're not trying to change anything. You're just taking note. Where am I holding tension? What am I feeling? What's my energy level at? How's my arms feeling? How are my muscles feeling? How's my stomach? And you're just gonna scan through your whole body. And again, this only takes maybe a minute to 90 seconds, but get in the habit of doing this because what we're trying to promote is interoception, which means the awareness of your own body and emotions, getting in touch with yourself. We get so wrapped up in our work. We go, 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 go. And check in our, our Twitter feeds all the time. We lose touch with our own bodies and our own emotions. And I want people to start getting into the habit. Frankly, once you, you do this on a regular basis, you will get to the point that when somebody says something, you can't in a matter of seconds, just do a quick, how am I feeling? Okay, I'm ready for this. Or not today, Satan. <laughs> not not doing this this is somebody else's work i i want to uh, the, the other thing i want to emphasize is that there should be multiple people there ready to take this on let's say that um you're in a meeting let's say there's 10 co-workers there and somebody says something that's inappropriate demeaning harmful whatever it may be um doesn't matter what their intention in because is because remember we're talking about unconscious bias this is just unconscious bias leaking out you may not be ready to interrupt that, but hopefully you have gotten to a place in your training with your group and everyone there that everyone has the psychological standing and the confidence that someone else is gonna step in. That's our goal. That one way or the other, if you're not capable of doing it, someone else is gonna be right there filling in for you because they feel okay at the moment. But most importantly, I don't want this to be, this conversation should never be damaging to you. If it's damaging to you, you won't keep talking about it. And my goal is to talk about it so often and in so many different locations that it stops being incredibly huge emotional labor. I want us to use exposure therapy and remove the fear of this entirely by making it completely normal and prosaic and absolutely uh, regular and routine. That's what I would like to happen. We've got um, a few other questions here. Kimberly says, how do you reinitiate a conversation when someone tries to shut down discussion by dismissing any correction as being quote unquote woke? Um, okay, so it's possible you can't reinitiate that conversation. However, um, you can do it uh, a little bit at a time. You may never get passed into that deeper conversation. There's no way to know. Um, but you can say things like, you keep using that word woke and I'm confused. What do you mean by that? What does woke mean? Um, and you can start digging into what exactly they're trying to uh, say to you. What is it they're trying to defend? What is it they're afraid of? What are they saying? Instead of constantly trying to drive your point home because that's not working for you, then flip the script to the other side, disrupt that pattern and make them explain themselves. You know, confirmation bias is extraordinarily pernicious. Human beings are the only species that suffer from it. Confirmation bias is when you believe something that's wrong, you are shown evidence that proves it's wrong, and it makes you believe it harder. Mm -hmm. um, the one of the only ways we have found to break through confirmation bias is when you force someone who's suffering from it to walk you step by step through the entire process of what their belief would result in, how it would actually work. 
And so if you can get somebody to articulate all those things, they will eventually come to the point where they struggle to do so. And that's where your real opportunity for a conversation begins. Um, we also got another question from Kelly who says, are you willing to meet with book clubs or diversity task groups? I'm in several book groups and I'm a part of our town's diversity task group. Thank you so much for your willingness to take on this exhaustive task. Um, yes, asterisk. <laughs> um, <laughs> I work for myself. Uh, so my schedule is quite overbooked and pretty much most of the things that I do are for pay only because that's most of what I have time for because I got to uh, support a staff. Um, but I will tell you one thing, I'm for this book especially, I'm perfectly willing to um, send out uh, messages, uh, videotape messages for book groups. If my schedule permits, I'm happy to set up meetings. It's all, it all matters. It depends on uh, depends on the schedule. I do take vacations, but I do do DEIB consulting all the time. And if you are a DEIB consultant, you should reach out and, and we'll see how much uh, I can help you and how I may be able to help you. We're coming close to the end of our time here, um, but I... And Kelly says, I will reach out to you as I would pay for you to speak to us. So <laughs> duly, duly <laughs> noted here, Kelly, thanks for the follow through. Um, some of these conversations we will have one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, other people are in leadership positions probably on this conversation and are maybe going back to a task group or going back to their company. What are some of those first steps people who are trying to take a leadership role in this space? What are some of the first steps they should take? So yeah, one of the this chapters I wrote was devoted only to these kind of conversations that take place in, in organizations because it's very different when there's other people listening in. The stakes get so much higher. Um, there's a couple things I will say right off the bat, which is that evidence shows us that the standard DEI training that we have been using for decades now does not work. In fact, there's some evidence that shows it actually makes the likelihood for uh, discrimination and bias go up rather than down. That's number one. The other one is, is that one of the most common tactics we have is to bring someone in who's a moderator and just have a conversation about all the things that people of color at the company have suffered. So essentially you're asking people of color to open up their veins and bleed for you, and um, which they would be willing to do it if it actually accomplished something. But again, we find that those kinds of discussions, those honest conversations that we have about what people have gone through also do not move the needle and also in fact can make the possibility for discrimination and bias go up rather than down. So you're re-traumatizing people to no end. So stop, I would say stop using the standards and start thinking about what it is you want to accomplish. You know, interestingly, I, I spoke with Cindy Gallup, who's a business consultant, and she said, you know, if companies were actually uh, creating new policies, procedures, and workflows, there would be no need for any DEI committees or departments because DEI should never be separate, the, separate from your regular standard uh, way of doing business. It should be embedded. You should be the kind of company whose workflows and procedures already create an inclusive environment and you don't need some kind of watchdog or extra committee doing that. So when you stop thinking that racism is a knowledge problem, it is not. People know racism is wrong and there's no amount of training saying this is bad, you shouldn't do this, that's gonna actually move the needle. When you start approaching it as a behavior problem, then you might see the results. We know a lot about behavioral science. We know how to change behavior. Changing people's values, we don't know how to do that. I think we have to leave it there, Celeste. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Great questions. Such a pleasure. And on the behalf of Politics and Pros, I'd like to thank you, Celeste Headley, for doing this event with us um, and continuing this work on uh, racism, anti-racism. We'd also like to thank you, uh, Jen White, for moderating this conversation. Thank you um, for leading the discussion that we had this evening. Um, and we also like to thank our audience uh, for your continued support. We'd also like to encourage our audience to purchase Speaking of Race from Politics and Prose, the, the um, 
link is in the chat and all three of our stores are currently open for in-store browsing. Um, and I'd like to wish you all a good night. Goodbye. <laughs>